Today is my sister's birthday, and uh, to honor her birthday, I'm going to read uh, from a chapter of the novel that, that she inspired. And uh, in fact, I have two sisters. Um, these are pictures of them when they're younger. Um, this is the one whose birthday it is today. Isn't she a cute little pixie? And uh, this other one over here, look at her moping. Um, this is many years ago in Colorado. <clears throat> here they are again. Uh, this is Linda. That's her birthday uh, today at her wedding. Um, and there's the little flower girl. And that's Robin. And here they are again. This is Robin's wedding. Uh, Robin there, Linda there with cousins, the little flower girl, wife, and so forth. Uh, both my sisters are cancer survivors, cancer conquerors. And if there's anything that's funny about this chapter, I credit my sister with it because she has a great sense of humor. Um, so she likes white wine. So today, white wine uh, from Chateau Saint-Michel, uh, just outside of Seattle. <clears throat> when I moved to Seattle after college, I discovered Chateau Saint-Michel many, many years ago. Lovely wines, just love them. So for you, little sis, white wine, uh, and a reading from the chapter of the book. So let's get to it. It's chapter 25, and the name of this chapter is A Dog's Nose Nose. Cheers and happy birthday. <clears throat> so, shortly after descending the Curcio Mountain, Paul and Sheila invited the neighbors over for a yappy hour, each bringing a bottle of their homemade wine. Bluey ran circles around guests, ushering them to the wine bar and buffet. Sheila overwhelmed with dishes. No guest was permitted to leave hungry and without a doggy bag containing enough food for another meal. Bluey alternated between joining the conversation and keeping guests from wandering, wandering beyond the house. When Carrie Ann arrived, the pitch of barks increased, and a snout became a heat-seeking missile racing for her loins, and after inspection, yapped approval. The things dogs get away with. It just proves they're dogs after all. The sensors of a canine's nose are 1,000 times more powerful than a human's. The Aussie sommelier wasn't a wanderer. He was a sheepdog, a herder by instinct, who stayed with his master, except the day he pointed his, nose, his snout to the sky, sniffed, rotating his snout like a submarine's periscope, and inhaled deeply, nose muscles genuflecting in and out like fish gills, deciphering scent particles from the air. A soft moan ro rose from his gut, interspersed with sniffs, another moan, more sniffs, than a primordial howl, a call from the wild. He trotted down the driveway and down the road. His nose discerned a bitch in heat a mile away. Bluey led the guests to the top of the vineyard to watch the sunset over the Pacific and the moon ascend in the east, where, where they admired nature's unfolding canvas and sat upon the great wall of Merle. Carrie Ann opened a bottle of her wine and Bluey barked for the cork. She held the moist red end to his nose. He sniffed, liked what he smelled, then chewed the cork to pieces without swallowing. He's got a good nose, she said. Why don't you let him taste your wine, Paul suggested. She swirled the wine in her glass, then lowered it to a snout and fanned. He sniffed, then sniffed again. Paul wondered, is the dog smelling her wine or her womanhood? She dipped her pinky into the wine and held it in front of his face. He licked. One, two, three licks. Oh, it's really good wine, Paul said. I won gold at San Diego County Fair with it. Congratulations. Just then, John and Steph arrived in the mule, the one, car the one vehicle capable of navigating the treacherous pass on the steep property without tipping. Steph carried a 10-year-old shot to Montalea cab she and John could afford since they didn't plant a vineyard. Bluey led the mule up the hill, while John played along, letting the Aussie believe he was in charge. But the Aussie was in charge, letting John think he was in charge. 
Yes, the dog was that smart. Bluey announced the new arrivals with several loud barks, and John rubbed the Aussie's belly until Steph stepped into range of a crotch check. She deflected his nozzle by dropping to her knees and smothering Bluey with kisses, but when she stood, the terminator of Snatch wouldn't cease until he snuffed out his target. Paul, aware of the dog's nuances of speech, but not his wife's, noticed an unusual tone with a higher, urgent pitch. What is it, boy? he asked. Bluey responded with animated, high-pitched yelps, then lunged towards Steph, and as she backed away, Bluey barked at her, and everyone wondered what had gotten into the good-natured dog. Paul pleaded with Bluey to quiet down, and threatened to take him to the house if he didn't quit acting like a playboy without manners. He summoned Bluey to his side. The dog hesitated, realized this was serious, then trotted obediently to his partner, sat, and Paul rubbed his head. What is it, boy? What's the matter? Bluey covered Paul's face with licks and kisses, and as Paul's ear came into contact with Bluey's tongue, he heard a message from the same voice who admonished him for cruelty to slugs, urged him to declare before the bishop, here I am, and translated verses from his dog. Meantime, Carrie Ann and Steph introduced the four S's of wine tasting to a couple that recently moved to the neighborhood. The first S is for swirl, said Carrie Ann, who spun wine around her glass, even turning it upside down without spilling a drop. The second is for sip, said Steph, who sipped wine from her glass and hissed through her teeth. The third is for spit, said Carrie Ann, and both ladies spit wine into the vineyard. Can you guess the fourth S, asked Steph. Show us, said Paul. The fourth S is for shimmy, the two girls said in unison, demonstrating a fine feminine example of swaying gelatin as their fruits shook, collided, and rebounded with buoyancy, causing Paul to spit out his wine in laughter as happy hour accelerated into high gear. As the guests were leaving, Paul accompanied Steph and John to the road. My apologies for Bluey's behavior earlier this evening, Paul offered, which were graciously accepted as Steph and John loved dogs, Paul continued. Dogs can detect something wrong with a person long before any symptoms. I'd feel it at ease if Steph goes for a checkup. I guess it's time to get that mammogram, she said. For as much as Steph cared for others, she neglected herself, and the cancer Bluey detected was found in her breast, and Steph floundered in a flood of tears as she digested the news until rescued by Carrie Ann in a lifeboat, promising to wear a yellow bracelet, bracelet around her right wrist until Steph was cured. This took the diagnosis. They took the diagnosis as a wake-up call to eat more greens, less saturated fat, and to exercise more, and joined a boot camp to drill themselves into better shape. Paul blended a special, a special wine fermented from the thickest, darkest grapes and assured Steph if she sipped a little each day, it would shrink the tumor, kill cancer, and also cure heart disease, dissolve blood clots, improve digestion, and release an aura of beauty around her. Will it catch me a mate? Carrie Ann asked. Guaranteed, replied Paul, saying to himself, you've already caught me. Paul noticed Steph and Carrie Ann walking up his front hill every morning, and the back hill at dusk, to Bluey's pleasure, who barked welcomes, wagged his stub, greeted the ladies with kisses, and escorted them down the hill. One day, he was surprised to see them bike up the hill, something he couldn't do, even in the lowest gear. Carrie Ann accompanied Steph to the oncologist's office for a follow-up exam to discuss treatment options, and when Steph returned to the waiting room, she whispered, I've reached second base more times the last two weeks than the last 10 years. She was planning to have the lump removed, followed by chemotherapy, until follow-up x-rays revealed the tumor had spread beyond its original boundaries, and Steph decided to have her breast removed. Maybe I should do both at the same time and reconstruct my boobs bigger than yours, she said to Carrie Ann. Mastectomy is the new tattoo, Carrie Ann said. For sure, my scar will be bigger than your tattoo, said Steph. After we get through this, 
Jenny Lee and I will take you to 6th Street for some ink. Deal. As happens so often in life, you should be careful what you ask for, even in jest. After additional tests, the oncologist warned staff she had a dangerous, aggressive strain of cancer. She decided a preemptive strike to remove both would be the safest measure. When Paul heard the news, he commented to me, Thank goodness we were born men. They sure had the advantage over us in their younger years. When I was a kid, I was glad I was a boy because we could piss standing up. I'd hate to go through that. Just wait till our prostrate gets us, I said, knocking on the nearest wood. After meeting the plastic surgeon, Steph asked Carrie Ann, Do you think I should go for D's or double D's? Don't be ridiculous. You'd look larger than a bloated manatee suckling a calf and get more looks than you. Stick with the C stuff. Maybe you can get them cute and pointy, like Barbie. Not pointy, please. Perky, my perks for going through this. The doc says she can make them athletic. She paid me a compliment, you know. She said my belly doesn't have enough jelly to fill the new ones. Darn, I thought you'd get a tummy tuck out of this too. Doc says she may, su she may still suck some fat from my stomach and use what she can. What are you gonna use to fill the rest? She said I could use, use air or liquid to pump them up in the beginning to keep the skin stretched. What do you think? She said if I go with air and if it hurts, I won't be able to get the air out. Fuck that. Who needs more pain? Definitely going for the liquid. What about a facelift? Speak for yourself. Love you, girl, said Carrie Ann, embracing her. Steph excused herself to go to the ladies' room, and when she returned, showed Carrie Ann an unhinged shimmy. Why should I strap my boobs in an uncomfy bra anymore to keep them from drooping? Good thinking, Steph, said Carrie Ann, who dashed to the ladies' room and took off her bra in solidarity. Let's stop at Stone Brewery on the way home and down a beer, suggested Carrie Ann. Who cares if we scare people at the bar with our droopy boobs? Scare? Speak for yourself, Cal. The guys will be drooling. Let's enjoy this freedom for a while. Amen to that and the rawless cougars who drove to the brewery and ordered a pint each of wine barrel aged, wine barrel aged ale, reminding Carrie Ann of Paul's spoiled oxidized batches when he could, didn't use enough sulfates. The bartender provided service as a bee buzzing around two flowers as the guys at the bar tried to avoid gawking. As they were halfway through nursing their beers, Carrie Ann said, You know, Steph, I think everything's going to be all right. I think so, too. Carrie Ann accompanied Steph and John to the hospital for surgery, and after the patient returned home, Carrie Ann practically moved in to prepare meals, help clean the house, since the doc said no vacuuming, no dusting, no, no repetitive motions, and to empty Steph's drain sacks three times a day. This is supposed to be a piece of cake compared to changing diapers, Steph said as Carrie Ann prepared to empty the sacks. Thank God we never had to do that. This stench reminds me of pulling a one-week dead squirrel out of a trap when his rotten tail comes off in your hand, said Carrie Ann, who did all these, these chores and more, wearing the yellow gel bracelet around her wrist. Gross, said Steph. We can do anything after this. Even plant a vineyard? Anything but that, said Steph. Yours is enough for both of us. You in much pain? Nothing I can't handle with a little morphine. Love you, girl, said Carrie Ann, giving her a hug. Four, le four weeks later, when it was time to go to the doctor's office to have the bandages removed, Steph, feeling a deep sense of loss, asked Carrie Ann to go with her, fearing to see her flat chest alone for the first time. Hey, Steph, you look pretty good like that, said Carrie Ann to encourage her. You know, I've been thinking... Who needs boobs? They just get in the way. Why don't you save yourself the trouble of plastic surgery? You look like a teenage supermodel. You're beautiful. To hell with that. My reward after all this is cute perky boobs. A little over a month after reconstruction, Steph was back, back outside walking up the hills and another month after that, the two were biking again. When Carrie Ann, the goal setter, suggested they get into shape to return to Austin for a girls' weekend and a 100-mile bike-a-thon with Lance Armstrong and the Livestrong Foundation to celebrate. 
when they told Jenny Lee, she dusted off her bike and started training for the cycling event too, which would pass through the hill country, not far from her parents' home. Hill country, wide. Within a few months, they hadn't been in better shape since their 20s, and Carrie Ann noticed her clothes getting loose. Hey, Babs, would you mind cleaning out your closet? I need some smaller clothes. Steph gave Carrie Ann an evil eye, so she stopped calling her Babs and Barbie, even though the description was accurate. The girls looked terrific. The next year, they made the pilgrimage to Austin, joining thousands of survivors on the road with their bikes. The entourage led by Lance himself, victor of the Tour de France, victor over cancer. The event was as, as exciting for Carrie Ann as her first Beta Breakers race in San Francisco. And in the company of so many cancer warriors was, was emotional and uplifting for the three Amigas. For as little as Carrie Ann had helped her classmate Chip struggle through AIDS, she compensated for her previous neglect with an abundance of compassion and assistance to Steph. After the ride, which took them through the vineyards and the hill country, stirring, stirring Carrie Ann's childhood memories and causing her to say, this has got to be some of the prettiest country I've ever seen. They ended up at Moonshine's downtown, where Carrie Ann and Jenna Lee ordered the moonshine, while Steph ordered a Texas Tempranillo. And the woman who normally drank big California wines discovered she liked the local red and shared her glass with Carrie Ann, who liked it too. After their meal, the three, the three women walked with glasses of moonshine in their hands in defiance of Austin's liquor laws to the tattoo parlor on 6th Street, where Jenna Lee and Carrie Ann got, had gotten tattoos together. And this time, the normally reserved, conservative, logical Stephanie was initiated into the sisterhood of ink with fuck cancer permanently etched into her skin. Afterwards, they shouted, fuck cancer, all the way down 6th Street to Esther's Follies, where they were greeted by Esther herself, first at the ticket counter and then at the bar, who, after sharing quick stories with Carrie Ann, began her performance with an improvised ballad called Fuck Cancer, in honor of all the survivors who descended on Austin for the Livestrong event, calling out the three amigas to take a bow, with Steph showing off her tattoo. The next day, Carrie Ann delivered the remaining bottles of wine she brought to Austin to the Follies, and Esther started featuring cougar wine at the bar, with Carrie Ann creating a custom label named Esther in honor of the Cougar of the Cabaret and her Cougar Town Club. When it was discovered a few years later, Lance Armstrong had descended down the dark side of doping, cheating, and lying. The three amigas who had put their trust in Lance, and especially Carrie Ann, who continued to wear the yellow bracelet she had purchased from the Livestrong Foundation, felt betrayed. Their first reaction was to add a line to Steph's tattoo, sending Lance to the same destination as Cancer. But cooler minds prevailed, and they plotted their revenge near the finish line of the Tour de France. <clears throat> On Steph's fifth anniversary, Cancer Free, the three amigas traveled to Paris to celebrate. They purchased a lock, wrote their initials, and with a bottle of champagne, walked onto a ridge over the Seine, where Carrie Ann removed the bracelet, crossed out the V in Livestrong, and locked it to the railing of the bridge, writing on it with black magic marker, Fuck Lance. She handed the key to Steph, who filled three plastic cups with champagne. All for one and one for all, toasted Steph, and the three guzzled their cup. Steph threw the key into the river, and as the three shot in a unison, fuck cancer, fuck Lance. Hello, ladies, they heard and turned around and saw a petite American who snapped their photo alongside a woman with milk chocolate skin surrounded by a cloud of perfume, carrying in her arms 
a toy replica of the dog whose nose saved Steph's life.